In these videos, uh, I'm going to be referring to some handouts and other documents that I've prepared uh, that summarize some of the material that we'll be talking about uh, in the videos. Um, and uh, I'm going to probably uh, be referring to those handouts quite a bit. Uh, you'll be able to follow along with the videos much better if you actually print those documents out and have them in front of you while you're watching the videos. You can obtain the handouts and other documents, again, at my website. Uh, again, here is the address of my website, and the easiest way to get there is just to click the link in the info box. Okay, so let's turn this into an ionic bond. Now, I actually might, uh, we, we might see, uh, turn out that that might not be the best approach, but let's see why. Okay, so um, you guys both started by erasing the covalent bond, and then we know the negative charge goes on the carbon, obviously not on the magnesium, and the positive charge goes on the magnesium over here, so that's right. So you both avoided that common mistake. The common mistake would be to put a negative charge here, but there isn't really any carbon here, so we would never want to do that, because that would be a big mistake. Okay, good. Now, so remember that these two are the same compound. These are two identical compounds. These are both legitimate ways to write this compound, because this bond is actually kind of intermediate between covalent and ionic. This is correct, but this is more useful for solving problems. Um, now, um, if you were dealing with this as a covalent bond, well, then you could say that it was a polar covalent bond. In fact, it's very polar, and you would put a delta negative on the carbon and a delta positive on the magnesium. Um, but it doesn't make sense to use delta negative and delta positive for the ionic model. Delta charges only make sense for covalent. Um, so if you were going to draw it this way, then you would put in the delta. So when you've seen your instructor do this, I'm sure he always did it when he was using the covalent model um, over here. Uh, but we're probably not going to follow him there because, again, we're just going to switch to the ionic model, which would be just as good. Okay, so you only use deltas for covalent bonds, so we're not going to use those for good yards. But you can see then that this would give you the same lesson. Again, in, in either model, it seems like there's a negative charge on the carbon. But it's really easier to deal with it if there's a full negative charge. OK? OK, so that was the correct grid yarn. All right, so it looks like we've learned how to draw grid yarn. Uh, let me warn you about some other mistakes. Um, the, 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 uh, the halogen here can be very confusing. The halogen does nothing. The halogen does nothing when you're working with grid yarns. Now, this is confusing because we've seen lots of other reactions where halogens do things, right? We've seen reactions where halogens are leaving groups, and we've seen reactions where halogens are nucleophiles. Um, but that doesn't happen with the grid yard. This bromine over here has a strong covalent bond to the magnesium, even though I'm not going to show it, and it never dissociates from the magnesium. You write these like a pair. What this is really like is we've seen a lot of cases, I think, where we had sodium and potassium spectator ions, right? A lot of cases where we had sodium and potassium spectator ions. And how did these participate in the reaction? They basically didn't. That's why they're called spectators. All we did with these is we just used them to form ionic bonds to whichever new charges came up. Well, this is a spectator ion too. It just happens to be a spectator ion with two atoms in it. Um, but nothing is going to, these are not going to participate in the reaction at all. This is not a reactive halogen over here. Make sure you put the charge on the magnesium, because that's the correct place to put it, not on the bromine. So you should always draw this counter ion just like this, and it doesn't do any reactions. You just use it to balance whatever new charges you're making. Okay. So that's another common mistake to watch out for uh, with grid yards. So treat this like these counter ions. That should make sense. These were metal counter ions, and these are also metal spectator ions over here. At least this is a metal, and the bromine is attached to it, so it's along for the ride. All right. So far so good? All right. So those are some common mistakes to watch out for with grid yards. Now, Let's back up for a second. What type of role could this carbon play? I'm going to talk about something completely different for a second. What type of role could this carbon play? Would this carbon here be a nucleophile or an electrophile? An electrophile. 
and it would be an electrophile. Um, what characteristics does it have that makes it into an electrophile? It's lacking, um, well, it's because the VR is so That's right. So what's the charge on this? Well, it doesn't have a full charge, but it has a delta positive. Delta positive charge over here. Uh, I gave you guys the handout on SN2, right? Yeah. Well, if you look at page three there, it says, what are the characteristics of a uh, electrophile? The characteristics of an electrophile is, electrophiles are carbons with full or partial positive charges. On the top of page three of the SN2 handout, it says that electrophiles are carbons with full or partial positive charges. Well, here we have a carbon with a partial positive charge. Okay. Why does this carbon have a positive charge? Because it's bonded to somebody who's to the right of it in the periodic table. So you don't, like, in our exam, I mean, you use as a green unit, it's okay to use an ionic bond just because to make yeah. it easier when working with them. But for something like this, should we still stick to the delta positive, delta negative just because VR is not a metal? Oh, right. So remember that I'm taking a detour from green yards for a second. So yeah. this bond here is purely covalent. This is a purely covalent bond. So um, you should not use this trick of making all bond. You should not think you can make any bond ionic. You can only make that green yard bond okay. ionic. Yeah, I should have clarified that earlier. And the only, reason we, it, the only reason it was reasonable to treat this like ionic was because it was between a metal and a non-metal. Um, but most of the bonds you're seeing are between two non-metals from the right side of the periodic table, right? This is a carbon and a bromine from the right-hand side. So you would not want to turn this ion. That would be a huge mistake. That's right. This is just a covalent bond. So here you have to use the deltas. You have to use deltas over here. Okay. Now again, why did we get this to be electrophilic? Because it was bonded to somebody who was to the right of it in the periodic table. So um, prior to this time, every time we dealt with carbons, they were always electrophiles if they were reactive because they were bonded with people to the right of them. Well, now, how about the carbon in the green yard? Would that be an electrophile or the nucleophile? nucleophile? Nucleophile. What characteristic does it have that makes it into a nucleophile? The negative charge. One thing we should really stress is you've got to realize how charges are the key to the whole course. We've already been stressing how charges are the most important part of the picture. Notice how the charges tell you when things are electrophiles and when things are nucleophiles. Things with negative charges tend to be nucleophiles, and things with positive charges or delta positives tend to be electrophiles. That's one reason we've been really stressing the charges all along. Okay, so this is a nucleophilic carbon over here, um, which we haven't seen before in anything we've done. How did we get a nucleophilic carbon by bonding it to somebody to the left of it in the so periodic is, table? Is the NGBR then the electrophile, or is it just not anything like that? Uh, remember, this is just a spectator ion. Again, it's really easy to, to, um, to think that this is going to do something interesting. This does nothing interesting like in the reaction. Leaves. Yeah, it just leaves. <laughs> and we shouldn't even think of it as a leaving group, though. Um, it's just a spectator or a counter ion. It's just like the sodium or potassium ions. Oh, that ions. does make it make more sense. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So again, this is not going to participate in the reaction at all, except it will balance any charges that we make, just like sodium and potassium spectator ions have in the past. So I haven't shown the electrophile over here. That would be in a separate molecule. Mm -hmm. Just like over here, this was an electrophilic carbon, right? But I didn't show the nucleophile. There's no law that says that when you draw a picture of an electrophile, there's no law you have to draw the nucleophile at the same time. If I wanted to, I could put in the nucleophile, uh, but in this picture, I only had an electrophile. Well, in this picture, we only have a nucleophile. Okay. All right, the only point we wanted to make is that a Grignard is a way to get a carbon nucleophile. This is important when you're doing synthesis problems, because you have to know, when should I use a Grignard? Well, you should use a Grignard when you need a carbon nucleophile. You should use a Grignard when you use a carbon nucleophile. That's their whole role in life. Green yards give us carbon nucleophiles. And you shouldn't need to memorize that. That should be apparent once you change this into an ionic bond. And you see the negative charge over here. So what's the reactive atom in the green yard? The carbon. The carbon with the negative charge. It's the atom with the charge that's reactive, except this is not reactive. This is with the spectator. But generally, it's the, uh, so generally it's the uh, non-metal, non-metals with charges that are the reactive um, uh, atoms. You always want to focus on the charges. Uh, and is this going to be then at a head or a tail of an electron pushing arrow? A tail. So one of the very first things you should do with any grid yard is put it at the tail. Even though we don't know yet who goes at the head. Even though we don't know yet who, go who goes at the head, you should immediately put this at the tail, because we know that. And then you can figure out who goes at the head. So now we have a process for dealing with grid yards. When you see a grid yard, first rewrite it as an ionic bond. And then put the negative charge at the tail. And then look for somebody to put it at the head. That's what we always do with the grid yard. Ionic put it at the tail, and look for somebody to put it at the head. Okay, um, that's what grid yards do. Uh, okay, so that's our usefulness for grid yards. So far, so good. Okay. 
So let's see what we can do with Grignard's.